So welcome everyone to today's uh, seminar. Uh, today we have Wilke van der Schee um, talking about uh, the hydrodynamics um, and this model with Layectum. So it's very, uh, very nice. As a very tiny introduction to Wilke, I confirmed it's a bit of a path. So I confirmed with him that what I'm about to say is probably correct. So he, like me, actually did his PhD in Utrecht, so in the Netherlands. Uh, then he moved to MIT for a postdoc. Then he won his first grant in the Netherlands for a baby, and he moved a while back to the Netherlands. And then to CERN, where first he did a fellowship, and now he does his LD position, so a longer term position at CERN. And he recently also um, yeah, got hired, I guess, that's how you say it, for one day a week uh, for <laughs> back into the <laughs> Netherlands, uh, where, where he will start in September. So that is nice for a tenure track, yeah. Um, yeah, and I, uh, I work a little bit with him, so I'm very pleased to, to have him here today. He was traveling in this area and we sort of made it work to have a seminar on the Monday. So that's, uh, that's very nice. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much also for all coming and for, for having me here. I've never been with you. Well, in, well, in well, yeah, we will. Yeah, you said two sentences, but there's a couple of paragraphs. Yeah, but this is about yeah. That's that's that's, it. that's that's the speaker, right? So now, so what we usually do is for the speakers, we do a quick roundtable to introduce ourselves, that you know who you are talking. Ah, about. that's very useful. I was about yeah. to ask about the USR. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. So uh, I'll just start. So, well, you know, postdoc uh, in Alice, and uh, also uh, postdoc in Alice. Yeah. 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 Michael. Yeah, Michael. Yeah. Michael. Yeah. My also also name. Name. <laughs> and maybe what you worked on, like in one, in one of the yeah, so I've, yeah. I've worked with Mike for the last six years, so it's been a really long proposal. But I've heard a lot of like really nice things about you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm a grad student. I'm working with the Mark, also a grad student working on depth structure in C stuff. Hi, you know, Mary Raga on STAR and then soon to be on SQ. Hi, I'm Yoshi. I'm a grad student working on STAR, uh, specifically desktop structure and PC. Um, yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Laura. Um, I'm a postdoc in Alice. I work on the PC. You already know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, John, I'm uh, here. <laughs> what about you do what you want? I like that. Yeah, I do what I like to do. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm Mary, another graduate working in Canada. Hi, I'm Andrew. I'm a graduate student working uh, with STAR and then before I went to Hi, I'm Bianca. I'm a postdoc in the Cardinal Theory Group. I'm Ian. I'm a faculty in the Theory Group. Well, thanks also for this very nice introduction. So, so, uh, oh, so now sorry. we want to. Ah, yes. Yeah, so I know, of course, Bernd, Katie, and Tom have also. Yeah, hi, Wilke. Um, sorry to miss you. Um, you should have come to Yale in uh, April or May when I was there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still looking forward to your seminar. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks very much. I'll try to come again then, maybe. Um, I think Tom, I think Tom. Yeah, okay, it's my turn. Um, okay, hi, um, I'm Tom. Yeah, I, I may or may not come in, depending on the ranking later. Um, so yeah, I'm a graduate student at uh, STAR, and I'm work, actually working on ISOBAR. So yeah, I'm uh, very interested uh, in what you're about to tell us. Perfect. Okay, then we have the last one, if they want to say something. Katie, is uh yeah, hi, I, I, it's Katie. Sorry to miss you, Wilka. Uh, Sierra is also here, but she had to step out for a second, but she also does Jets and Elise. So looking forward to the talk. Very good. Okay, so now we now we went through everyone. So this is, this is so now the floor is yours. Perfect, well, thanks again. And uh, yeah, also really pleasure to be at you. I've never been here, even though I was in the Boston area, of course, many, many times. So it's nice that they're not on the mic. And of course, there's this paper here with Katie and Mike. So, so really nice to visit. Um, yeah, it's several topics that I could have talked about, actually. So there was one recent one in the Alice week. I think some of you saw about cross sections in LED, lab at LHC. 
then uh, there's of course the paper with Mike and Katie, but then I assumed that maybe you knew about that, but okay, I should have checked maybe. Yeah, but, yeah, but, but, <laughs> but then of course, the, perhaps the better choice here was of course there's a large star group and I think I'm actually quite excited that we're continuing on this kind of isobar collisions where you really kind of collide the zirconium and ruffinium and uh, compare these things. So it's really about nuclear substructures. It's a bit of a different topic that, that I normally did, but it actually worked very well. And uh, yeah, it's also a very nice collaboration with STAR. Uh, they had also nice interesting data. And uh, well, as many of you know, all, all of this is done uh, together with Hofert uh, at MIT. Good. So, yeah, so I'll try to kind of introduce a little bit like heavy ion collisions, triactum, what we do with the Bayesian, but very briefly, because that's not the main topic of this talk. And then I'll go to these isobar collisions and how we interpret these star results. Um, but to start, okay, just to set the stage, I mean, you know, most of you worked on this, although maybe not exactly everybody. Uh, this is kind of the standard model of heavy ion collisions, as, as I think we now understand this. Uh, so, so we are very excited with COVID and we have this, this code called Triactum. It's actually now two years old. It's, it's really done as a PhD project of Hover together with the supervisors Umut Bursoy and Raymond Snellings. Uh, so we call it also Triactum because it's, uh, it's the old Roman name of Utrecht. So all of this is based, uh, based I was also both at Utrecht at the time. We're really quite proud of it. It's very C++, it's very fast. You can, uh, you can download it, it's public, uh, public code. And we really, and also it's one of the main topics maybe of this talk, but it works quite well that we try to do everything really quite precise. Also comparison, comparing with experiments, so there's no, there's really few approximations in a way. Uh, and uh, for instance, with comparing with experiments, we try to put all the cuts and everything precisely equals centrality selections to do that also quite easily. It's, uh, it's running on Alex Plus at CERN, it's a scalable code, so also for these isobar collisions that will turn out to be quite important that we can really do millions of collisions in parallel and also analyze them in parallel, so you can, yeah, you can, you can really do get very high statistics. What does it do? So uh, well, heavy ion collisions are typically made for this collision. Uh, then there's kind of this, what we call initial stage, uh, where, where things kind of, what we now call hydrodynamize. So, so first of all, at first you have a far from equilibrium stage. I mean, it's not instantly hydrodynamic quadrupole plasma, but after a while, we think it's kind of hydrodynamized and becomes describable by viscous hydrodynamics. And we now know that this is not isotropic as you may be expected. If everything's completely thermal, it will be completely isotropic. But you have these gradients, and the gradients are very large, uh, not only in the transverse direction, but mainly also in the longitudinal direction. So you have this kind of boost invariant kind of code, and you have a shear viscosity, bulk viscosity. You have a question already or not? Okay, good. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. it's supposed to be a small seminar. Just interrupt any time and just make it a bit of a discussion, maybe. Um, but okay, now you go to hydrodynamics. So there's a shear viscosity, bulk viscosity. Uh, and in, in red, I highlighted here the, the number of parameters we have in the model and which we put into this Bayesian type of analysis to constrain, because all of these things have uncertainties from a theoretical point of view. For instance, the shear viscosity by, from first principles in QCD is very hard to compute. In ADS-CFT, for instance, it's infinitely strong up and infinite n, you know it's kind of one over four pi, but that's of course a very rough approximation. So you don't really know the shear viscosity. And actually there are three parameters here because we're also interested in the temperature dependence. So it's kind of slope, it can also have a curvature and bulk viscosity. Similarly, you expect it maybe to be small because uh, if, if some of you is skill invariant, it should be zero, but okay, because he's not skill invariant. So we have also have three parameters like the, the height, the, the width, and the location uh, as function of temperature. And in triactum, we also vary three second order transfer coefficients. So that was not really done before. So we can put it new. And, and at some point, you could go to this kind of confinement to crossover to, to from uh, yeah confinement to transition from particle plasma to particle particles hadrons and you get this cascade of uh, hadrons and interaction you can use uh, your QMD or a smash and there's one parameter here so there's a certain temperature and it's also a parameter it turns out to be about 153 MeV it's really close to the QCD translation moment I didn't say much about this initial stage uh, partly because it's quite uncertain so there are many models and it's very interesting but in, in, in triactum, as, as done actually mainly started, I think, so with the Duke group. So, this, this is famous paper by Jonas, Scott, and Stefan about what well, is it now? I quote this nature physics paper, but they're older ones, Trento model in particular. So, they did a lot about actually not maybe solving this, but phenomenological ansatz. And that's also what we try here. And then in the future, we'll try to kind of connect it maybe more with theoretical approaches like, like ADSCT or kinetic theory. Uh, but first, you need kind of some ansatz or. Connected IP plasma, so something like that. But, but in, in, in this model, it's just 
I would say just phenomenologically. So you just have seven parameters, including cyclic truss structure. So you have a kind of Glauber model where you have like your nucleons at certain positions. Okay, you more or less know this by multiplying Glauber, but the nucleons can have a certain size. They can have constituents. So there's also a parameter and the constituents have a size and it's also a parameter. Then there's like how you convert, if you have two left moving and right moving uh, nucle uh, nucleus, you need to convert this to an energy density for your hydrodynamics. That's also a parameter. So you kind of have this Trento scaling in this case of so TA times TB to some power, so more or less. So, so, so this is kind of just to give you a flavor, like what, why, what, why this is so uncertain and how we kind of handle this by, by basically parameterizing to a molecular model. So in this case, we have some free streaming uh, stage. So you assume basically that your, your particles, which are at the collision, you create that they free stream with the speed of light it was done previously in the cube model. But in this case, we don't do it necessarily with the speed of light, but also with, with, with a speed that varies. So actually it turns out to maybe be more like 75%. And you shouldn't think about gluons moving at 75% speed of light, but more like some effective uh, velocity, an average velocity. And this is going for some time, and the time is also a parameter. And also, what's very important actually are the fluctuations. So every nuclear nuclear collision, like a PP collision, doesn't produce like a certain amount of energy, but it produces an amount of entr uh, energy entropy with a distribution. Right? So the PP collisions they also fluctuate event by event. Okay, so this is my five minute summary about what heavy ion collisions are. Yeah. Why is the initial stage not 10 parameters then? So, oh, yeah, I've well, we mentioned this at some point, it doesn't add up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would say 10. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. so um, I mean, those two in the initial stage, those two figures imply different resolutions. So, what is the resolution? I mean, the Minus resolution in order the subnucleonic structure. Yeah, so you know, the well, resolution you mean numerically or like in physically? Uh, Be I mean, in your calculation. Yeah, yeah. So, in, in, well, these these two are just different seconds of the parameters. So, in principle, okay. we can have a we can have a situation like this or a situation like this, and we kind of have the model, and the model should determine which one. And of course, it, you can actually guess a little bit. For instance, like if you have something like this, you get like relatively high gradients. You get relatively strong flow, mm -hmm. and you get a little bit higher mean PT. But then, for instance, if you have a bulk viscosity, you get some lower mean PT. So there's kind of this competition between effects. So these things, kind of, in in a way, the global analysis, the data kind of determines which one it is. And then, in practice, you have to be a little bit careful because this situation like this is easy to model, but this one you need to have like a somewhat finer grids. So so you have to work a bit. But of course, you don't want the grid size to be determining what your parameters are. So this is kind of something you need to be a bit careful about. Okay, so that depends on the parameters and how you select the parameters. Yeah. So okay. So that's that's by using analysis. I think I don't okay. say you much about this. Well, okay. I'll say a little bit more about it. It's not the topic of this talk. Yeah. I have a question on the last part, the cascade of hadrons. So you said you can be either European B or smash. Yeah. So what, I mean, I feel like if you use SMASH, you might get a different set of parameter space that works well with SMASH and different works well with URQB, is that correct? Yeah. Or, or is that independent of all of the others? Um, there is some small differences. I mean, we actually find it like eta over S, it changes like from 0.08 to 0.10 or something like that. So like, that's all significant, no? I would say it's not significant. No, I mean, it's within the band, but oh. it's actually um, I, somewhat important. But the difference is, well, of course, Smash is made from European B in a way, right? So it's really based on European B. I think, in a way, it's better, right? I mean, people mm -hmm. are working on it. There's more right? There's also development. Yeah, so that's there is two important things, of course, in, in, in the spectacular pattern. It's like how many resonances in QCD do you put in? Mm -hmm. And yeah, in principle, more is better, and then you get a little larger phase space and things like that. And it really changes a bit, although. If you add or you smash, you add some resonances, but they're like at 2 TeV. So mm -hmm. they're really both mm -hmm. suppressed quite strongly. So it doesn't matter so much. And then there's the cross section. How do you do the cascade? So it matters a little bit. Jetscape first looked at it. They both smash your PMD and they say the eye is kind of the same. Well, in, in a recent paper, uh, just before the ISO bar, we did the, the quantitative comparison. We took the ratios and half of V2, you find like 4% difference, maybe. So it's kind of Four percent. So within yeah. also within the insert. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're very similar. 
What's important here for this, maybe more important, Janscape also analyzes a little bit if you particleize. So it's not just you have some, if you, you say, if everything's isotropic and you have a thermal thing, then you more or less know, well, you just take your resonances, you do a Boltzmann fit, and you have particles going mm -hmm. with the Boltzmann distribution. But it doesn't work because that's completely isotropic. And if once you've thermalized, it's not isotropic, you have gradients. So you have more pressure in one direction than the other direction. If you do isotropic particles, you have pressures equal in all directions. So you need to correct for this so it's kind of viscous particleization, we call it. So, uh, we, we use this method probably by Yona and uh, previously Scott Pratt looked into that and Jorge Torrieri. And so you kind of shift your spectra in one direction and in the other direction, the other way around. So it's such a way to conserve energy, but also to go so such that the stress energy tensor is completely smooth. Mm -hmm. But there's some arbitrariness here that, that's somewhat important yeah, fair and gets bigger once the viscosities and gradients are bigger. Okay, I'm going very slowly. Huh? Anyway, so uh, triactin. So, so, okay, so we're quite proud of it. So, this is more or less how it works, just to give you some kind of flavor. So, you have like, this kind of parameter file where all the shear viscosity and all the parameters are put in. And it's actually, you download it, you compile it. And I think, uh, yeah, people here, they used it. And it's actually, yeah, so, so the most difficult thing is to compile Smash, actually. So, so that's we're quite proud of that, that point. And then it, it really looks a bit like this. You have this initial condition, you have this hydro, which goes out. And in real time, you see this actual simulation of. Uh, Particles generated. I mean, in reality, there are more depending on the liquidity window, but these are ACD specimens decaying, they scatter a little bit. So, so this is really how these heavy ion collisions look like. It's a somewhat peripheral collision. And what's for instance nice about reactor, what we try to so, so we have this entropy acceptance probability. So, so here also I put all the output, which is one event. And what it can do is it can run many, many Trento events, in this case, maybe 100. And then we should be everything is rejected, like zero. And with like 5% chance, you get a, 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 an event in the 25% invalidity bin. So, so we can kind of select which one, which event from the Trento distribution it wants to generate more, and you get weights. So you can get a weighted distribution as function of centrality. Uh, and for the isobars, it's also quite important because we are well, not 25%, but then we do the ultra center collisions, we, we weigh higher, uh, they have lower weight, and we, do, we simulate more, and we get higher statistics in certain centrality regions, which is uh, very useful. Okay, so then uh, well, you have your model, you have your 20 dimensional parameter space, and what do you do? This kind of what Bill maybe asked a little bit, like how do you get the parameters and things like that? And typically, what you do, and it's like somewhat, this is already what we did a long, long time before, and not really topic of this talk, but you run your model at like 1000 points, so you call design points. And there you kind of get high statistics or relatively high statistics, and you get your results. And these are kind of raw outputs. and. Well, you, you, you compare with at least observables in this case, so you can have the, the yields here, you have spectra, and well, may I'll put it on the next slide because it's easier to see. Uh, so, so it's really this, the spectra for pions, chaos, protons, as function of PT. We have elliptic flow versus centrality. We have elliptic flow versus PT for also identified particles. In this case, we also did PLED, but now no, we don't do that anymore. Uh, at least we'll, we'll get back to that. Uh, at, at like a point, we do 2.7 TeV, we do 5 TeV. And how you, how you get this is this really, so this kind of MCMC. So you really have base formula, you get a Markov chain of like likely values of this 20 dimensional parameter space. And what's of course important, if you do this MCMC, you really need like millions of evolutions of your model at different points in this 20 dimensional parameter space. And so the essential thing to speed this up is to do what I said. So you kind of have this, 1,000 points I'm showing here as raw data. From that, you can construct this kind of Gaussian emulator. And from this 1,000 point, it can at any point in the parameter space predict your observables very efficiently or relatively efficiently. And then you can quite easily do millions. And then you can construct this MCMC chain. And so then you really have a probability distribution. And actually, for instance, these viscosities I was showing here are the results of such, a, uh, such an evolution, such a global analysis where you fit all the data points. Uh, and you really get some kind of constraint or 90% probability region given the data, given the model. Uh, and one of the main results, for instance, from this analysis is that we got, like, if you look at scale and extremely small build viscosity, so it's like 0.005. Uh, and that's really because, I mean, we, we verified this compared to this Duke analysis before, which is very similar analysis. But what we did is we, we fitted many more data points. So we really have this uh, PT spectra. 
and also the PT dependent V2, and that was not done before. That, that really resulted in this much smaller build viscosity. And it's also important to note because previously people thought you need a large build viscosity to get the mean PT down. But that's not entirely true because in this case, we also fit the mean PT well. We fit the spectrum well, we fit the mean PT well, and you still can have this small build viscosity. But you have to go to a slightly different parameter regime, maybe in this model. So it's kind of this, this, this kind of power of a global analysis. It's a little bit quick, maybe, but I should also get to the isobars because that's the topic of this talk. These are actually these parameter distributions. And um, here I also, yeah, so so, okay. so these are all the parameters and all the probability distributions. Uh, this is actually before, I think some of you were in this Ali talk. Uh, so we have a width distribution of the nuclear width, which is kind of at point uh, at point ninety six, and now it's a bit smaller because we include this cross section. So that's kind of new results which are not included in in, in the isobar work, uh, which is important. And then there are many other parameters like uh, eta over s, r is three, and I don't want I don't have time to go into all of these details. One thing what I wanted to mention here is is uh, is that that we have this centrality normalization, and that's also for this star results. I'll go a little bit more into it, like. What the centrality normalization means and, and why it's important, and, and you actually see. So centrality normalization, I should probably explain that you, um, well, in, in theoretically but experimentally, it's quite hard to say what is, is the centrality is like. Zero percent is central collisions, hundred percent is very very peripheral collisions. But what is hundred percent is actually a little bit difficult to determine, both theoretically and also experimentally, because it means that it's like one particle, <laughs> and okay, the zero one particles is actually not easy. Uh, so that's also why, and theoretically, we kind of know you have Monte Carlo Glauber. So you have, if you have one nuclear nucleon collision, then in principle you have like a PP, PP like collision, and you expect like at least the, the cross section to kind of match the PP cross section and to get like one particle. But even then, there is a little bit of an uncertainty if you do this fully correctly, and it depends on parameters. So here we put the centrality normalization as a parameter. It's actually this last one here. And well, it actually turns out to be 101. That's the preferred value. So, so this, what, what it means is that we do like what we do with the Monte Carlo Glauber, and then we rescale this 100%, 101. And in, in fact, it can also mean, and this may be somewhat important because experimentally, I think at least for now estimates that they have experimentally an uncertainty of uh, in 100% point of 1%. Uh, so in, in this way, by varying this parameter, you can actually take into account that, uh, that experimental uncertainty. Which actually is a very important uncertainty for the, especially for the spectra and the peripheral bits. You can kind of easily imagine this. It's a log scale, so the spectra are very steep. It's a very peripheral collision. You get fewer and fewer particles, it's maybe in the orders of 10. And if you shift a little bit this 1%, then because it's so steep, you, you, these, these, these data points, they go up by like 8% or so. So it's really the dominant uncertainty for these data points. And what's interesting is also for the V2. It's quite steep here. The function centrality also kind of dominant uncertainty. So these, these uncertainties are all correlated. So what's, what's kind of nice about this method interacting, which we can now do, is just by varying this systematically within this Bayesian analysis, that once you vary it for, of course, the spectrum, then it varies automatically for everything else. So it's automatically all correlated. Uh, so in this case, we, we kind of take, take, care, take this into account very nicely. Oh, um, sorry. Yeah. Can, can I consider right here? Of course. Yeah, so in your, like, yeah, this very slide in your um, uh, corner, in the corner, like the, the uh, bottom right. So you actually say like the X axis is the uh, like centrality normalization. Whereas in your um, red, like the red curve that you're showing, you already says is like centrality normalization is set to be like 100%, right? So right. how is it that um like the the red curve on the bottom right is still having a distribution instead of like just a delta function uh, at 100. yeah yeah okay so that that's that's indeed the it's a, it's a very good question we tried to explain in the paper uh so so so, so the two settings so the, the blue one is just what what i just doing what i described basically so you vary the centrality normalization this dash curve is where we put the centrality at 100% by hand. So this is kind of what the old model models all used to do. So this would show the difference. And, and you're very right that, that in principle then, well, there's two ways. Either it's a delta function at 100, which is one way to see it, but we didn't tell the MCMC that we did this. And that's the essential point here. And that's why it, it actually does get a distribution. So we, we did it in the model, in Triactum, 
but we didn't do it in the MCMC. So the MCMC doesn't know that we put it at 100. And it's actually, for us, it was an interesting test. Uh, so if, we, if the model doesn't depend on the centrality normalization, you expect the curve to be exactly flat because there's no dependence by construction. And interestingly enough, it's not exactly flat, right? You see at 105, it's going slightly down. Uh, and this is just a, an artifact of the model in a way. So this is really the MCMC kind of interpreting signals which are not really there. So it's, you have to interpret this statistically. So it, it should not be exactly flat because there might be some leftover signal uh, which is just statistics. And that's also why you should always be careful interpreting these curves. So, so in, in a way, you cannot say that zero is much more, 85 is much more likely than 105, because well, all of them are quite likely. And I'm, well, we're, I mean, we're quite happy with these results because it is quite flat. So I think that the model works well. Is that an answer to the question? Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I get the point. Thanks. So it's only from the correlations with all the other parameters that it gets me about one of no, in this case, it, 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 this red curve here actually doesn't have anything to do with centrality normalization anymore because we fixed it to 100 for the, the dashed curves. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, in that sense, you have to be careful interpreting this, but we thought there was still quite some value to show these, these dashed curves everywhere, to show the old method, but also to show what we got uh, to kind of show you how this emulation and design with the correlations kind of still has some kind of its own uncertainty, which is kind of the non-flatness of that curve, which is not that, that non-flat. Yeah, okay, then now I want to go to the ISO bars, but if there's still one more question about the model or the BE system, then, then I can still take that. Uh, and this is actually, yeah, so this is kind of the, the, the brief overview of the global analysis. I, here we put like 20 data points randomly sampled, but for the ISO bars, we just took what we call the maximum a posteriori. Uh, these 20 points are very nice. In the paper, you can see more. You, you can uh, then uh, compute the spectra, the V2, et cetera, for all these 20 points, and you get a systematic uncertainty. So we don't only get statistical uncertainties, but we get systematic uncertainties because we don't know the viscosity very well, for instance, and uh, all the other parameters. Where these, these color points are all taken into account the correlations between the parameters, which is then, of course, very important. No more questions here, then. Shift to the star results. This is a lot. These actually now it's all stars. So it's not so nice to talk in this way again for, for yield, I suppose. But this is, yeah. So these eyes of our collisions at star are, of course, very exciting. Uh, so so well, I kind of don't have to explain the idea here, but you're all working on this. But this is that station. So, so of course, it, it, they have the same baryon number. That's why it's an isobar. And one has a higher charge than the other. So in principle, if these, these were perfect spheres, this, this would be completely ideal, right? You, you collide two things and the only thing that's different is the one has 10% higher charge than the other. So, I mean, ruthenium trivially generates 10% larger magnetic field. And if that's the only change, then, then you can really study what happens as a function of the magnetic field. Uh, and uh, no, there are all kinds of signals you could expect. And not only the chiral magnetic effect, although that was one of the, the big motivations, uh, of course. And, and indeed, yeah, because a lot of systematics and backgrounds, and it's, it's all very difficult, but one should take the ratio between these two things, like viscosity and things like that, and we actually can show this a little bit. All these kind of uncertainties you don't really know, if you take the ratio, they more or less cancel, and you're kind of left over with this, this charge, and, and, and well, the idea is very beautiful. And the analysis was also very beautiful. Uh, but let me say that here, it, it was a very precise analysis, and it was completely blinded, so this was, you know, you also all know that it was like a run of ruthenium, run of zirconium, and, and the ruthenium in batches uh, after the other. But only at the very, very end, uh, it was uh, re revealed like which runs for ruthenium, which runs for zirconium, and maybe even the experimentalists didn't know. Although you never, you can probably, you could have guessed, I guess. But um, so, 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 okay, so, so then of course, well, this is kind of unfortunately no CME detected. Uh, it's not actually the topic of this talk uh, because triactin, that's also why we didn't do this in advance. It's maybe a little bit unfortunate. We could, of course, have made some predictions in a way, but we didn't do it in advance because we thought we could not model this because we don't have a magnetic field in triactin. We were working on it in a way slowly. Uh, so, so we don't see these kind of CME signals by the magnetic field because we don't have that, but we will look at other things like these backgrounds in particular. Um, but okay, so so. Um, yeah, so, so, so there was this kind of, I mean, I don't want to go into this, all these observables, we can talk about it later. Uh, this kind of VT, V2 with 
like sign particles and unlike sign particles, because this, if you compare the, 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 the same charge going up or the, going down, that this magnetic field should kind of push that. Uh, the, the, those are the, the, these observables are made. And it was decided before that once this was above one, that would be a CME like signal. And then, of course, that all of it turned out to be below one, which was actually a bit of a surprise. And uh, yeah, it would also, this well, would have been great, to, of course, to discover the CME, but it actually, in the end, maybe was a bit fortunate that there was all these background effects, which we don't fully understand. And that's what will be the main topic of the rest of the talk, that we have to really understand how the geometry of these two nuclei determine the outcome. And it was a bit of a 50-50, actually. I mean, these background effects, for all I know, they could have been the other way around, right? So, and then, of course, there would have been a New York Times article that we discovered CME, which would just have been these background effects. So it was actually, I think it was 50-50 that it was actually quite fortunate that it worked out this way, because now we can go back to the drawing board and really try to understand instead of uh, having something we don't completely understand in New York Times. But, so that's I don't know, my personal opinion. But uh, okay, so, so what did we do in, in uh, so as I, as I said, we don't have this magnetic field. So, so we really have to understand these backgrounds because they are very important. So the, and these nuclei, they're not really alive. And that, that, that turned out to be key. Uh, and so, so, okay, so we, well, in this case, we didn't really do a full Bayesian analysis, although I guess we have the technology and we could do that at some point, although it would be very expensive um, computationally. So in this case, we just did like five different collisions of ruthenium and zirconium with different sizes and shapes. And, and that, of course, causes differences in V2, elliptic flow, triangular flow, mean Vt, and things like that. And okay, and of course, I want to kind of go through a little bit the motivation, which five parameter sets we took. So these are these five cases. And what, so there are a few things which are important. So for instance, this is a very old one, the first one, and the, and the second one as well. This is also what STAR has in their paper. So that's just the, the, the motivation for these two. So the first one comes from electron uh, ion um, scattering experiments. You kind of get some, some kind of size, some, some radius. And you can also from, get estimate some ellipticity of the nucleus itself. So, so this is this beta two is the ellipticity. And the sizes here are the same for, so the R, so the R proton, R neutron, and then some kind of uh, thickness. So it's kind of how, how, how uh, well, how sharp the edge is. So, and these are also the same here for protons and neutrons because it's also quite old. Uh, but also for electron ion experiments, you don't get the neutron. So you cannot make this distinction. Then there's a theoretical moment, uh, model. So it so made sense what started, right? It was an experimental and theoretical model. They're not really the same at all, actually. That's quite funny because beta 2 here, ruthenium has a larger elasticity than zirconium. And for the theoretical models, the other way around. They use the same size. And then there's this model three, which is actually much more recent. So this is the DFT. So it's, it's, it's a model by, uh, by, by Fujian Wang and his group. Um, and, and there, and that turns out to be actually very important. So you can do the density functional theories, very recent computation. And you see that what's actually very important is that the, the protons and the neutrons are very different. So the radius are very different. I mean, it's not very different, but this 0.52 and this 0.57 is quite important. But, it matters in size. And this is already the first hint why these things are so different, right? I mean, you have, of course, more protons than neutrons in ruthenium, and they have different shell models. And so, so, so these, these nuclei are not the same at all. If you go to nuclear structure, people will have all kinds of stories about it. So that's already quite important. And one thing I put here is uh, the cross section. So this is computed then in triactum, actually, or you can do it also in Trento. Um, and, and here you see, for instance, because of this neutron skin, the ruthenium is has a much, well, much lower, smaller cross section. On, considering that these things should be almost exactly equal, right? that was the assumption. Then this difference in the cross section of 4.73 or 4.86 is quite large. So it's like a few percent uh, that zirconium is bigger than ruthenium. And of course, they have the same kind of energy or number of nucleons. So, so the size will translate into a different kind of MPT and things like that. And, and also, for instance, here you see these, lot, these more recent models, this 345, they have the same characteristics in this, this way, so it's really quite accurate. And here it's actually reversed for the first case. So here, ruthenium is bigger, and this is actually not correct. This three and four were, so there's the same proton neutron radii, but the difference here is just by assumption, and that's also why well, these models are maybe not as great, is they put the beta 2 to be zero for both or 0.16 for both. So this is like completely spherical by assumption, and this is a little bit deformed 
by assumption, you get slightly different values. That's of course not very realistic. Actually, we kind of know in the end, or could have, well, I guess it's kind of known that this, this, this ruthenium has a larger beta two than, than zirconium. Uh, and that's this case number five. And it's actually, we took this from, from also this paper by Yang Yong and Kim Yang. Uh, I have to stress here that this last paper uh, was published a few days after the star results came out and well, they're star members. So this, this day, they knew this data and, and these uh, parameters are actually fitted to the star data using ABT. So ABT is not a hydro model, but it behaves very similar to a hydro model so it's just cave. So, okay, so, so what I say for instance, in the end that this model five will fit much better than the other models. It's partly because it's more recent. It's partly because this beta two and beta three are more advanced in this density functional theory, but it's also because it's not a prediction, it's a post diction. This, this point two, this, this kind of triangularity of the pier shapes of, of zirconium is fitted to data. So it's, it's a post diction, uh, but okay. And then it will work very well. So this one, the motivation. So yeah, this is a very interesting table. Thanks for putting it up. Um, it's kind of interesting to me that the uh, first two up there don't have, you know, a larger neutron radius. They assume the same. I mean, in shell model or anything, you would expect a neutron skin. So, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's. I mean, Star also has some. If they look at some other model, so it's not only case one and case two, but this is their main modeling for for also the centrality normalization, which is all very important. I'll also go to that into my next slide. Um, yeah, okay. I mean, there's nothing to say, right? I mean, you're completely yeah. right. I mean, Thanks. but it's also if you do electron scattering that you don't see the neutrons. Yeah. So That's it's not really so easy. Thank you. Oh, yeah. What is the, for number three, what is the uh, problem with the sigma p uh, smaller? Than for ruthenium than zirconium. I mean, I understand the zirconium, the, the sigma n is being larger, but I don't understand why the second column in the third row. Yeah. It also it compensates a little bit with the 5.06, maybe, right? I mean, if you have smaller radius and larger sigma, you get similarly slate shaped than this one. I mean, it's just a bit more spread out, but kind of similar size on average. But I, I yes, I, I, I understand the RP. Uh, shouldn't sigma correlate with the RP in order because then if you put more then they are more spread out because they're they're I mean positively charged they can't, they can't be more condensed yeah, that's a very naive thinking but maybe that's wrong doesn't uh, have to do with the cross section so in the end I mean, you can't make too large of a cross section well this is how the protons are distributed within mm -hmm. the yes so, uh, and the answer is just, I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a result of density functional theory, but uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So for the, uh, the beta three, that, so you mentioned that it was fit to beta. So, but like, what is it about zirconium that would make it have like the pear shape over the beta? Yeah, so it's really pear shaped. I mean, it's, it's quite dramatic. Um, it is yeah nuclear structure people i think they, they they do find things like this so it's kind of understood in you know i think in a phenomenological well if i mean mean field theory putting these protons and neutrons in some kind of distribution why it is so i mean you can also turn it the other way around why would it be spherical right but it's really symmetry breaking of course uh but okay i mean that makes sense you put a lot of things it's like iron magnets and there's some there's some faces and then these ones are just lower energy mm -hmm. Not a very good answer. Why this one is? And it's about these shells that you can. Okay. It's nuclear nuclear physics, man. Yeah, yeah. It's, so it's so the that's, the parameter, right? that's just the parameter when they're comparing the and Yeah, but I think he was asking like, if you look at like, if I tell you I have forty neutrons and I have uh, what is it like, uh, well, forty protons and then fifty six neutrons, do you can you intuitively see why it would be pure shape? The answer, I guess, is no. <laughs> but it's not. I mean, if it means field theory and competition, I mean, it's not. Yeah, it's not accidental that they didn't know. It's not. It's not so easy. But you do the mean field theory. You try to put them. You try to. And in the end, of course, the ground state. Yeah. So nuclear structure is a big topic. The ground state is symmetric in the end because okay, the theory is rotational symmetric. It's just that you have like this state plus the other way state plus all the other ones, and the superposition of all these states is then the true ground state, and you pick one. And it's actually quite interesting because you collide it. It is a superposition of all these states, but kind of these collisions are kind of a measurement. So these, they fluctuate between these two kind of states. And 
very systematic way, and then uh, yeah, you really pick one okay. uh, because these fluctuations are very slow on the time scale population. Okay, okay, then well, maybe I should actually even skip it because I'm running out of time. But I mean, this was just a bit, the, the slides that we, we tried to kind of go through this analysis of star very carefully, like doing all the cuts in the same way. And what turns out to be actually very important that star uh, has this, well, you have centrality, which translates to multiplicity. So you have like certain end track of line and, and it's a centrality bits. But you have to read the paper quite carefully because star defines centrality not by the, the zero to five percent collisions, for instance, in the zero to five percent centrality bin, because star likes to have an integer number of um, particles, number of tracks. Uh, and especially if you look at the very peripheral bins from, from well, almost 70 to 80 percent, they put it from eight to 15. And for instance, it also means that the multiplicity, well, this, this, uh, the distribution is pretty flat here. It's like you can linearize it. So you see that you always get an average multiplicity in the centrality bin, which is integer or half integer, right? So you get 11.5 or you get 10.5. So for instance, this is very important in this kind of multiplicity plot if you go to peripheral collisions because it's only integer or half integer, you get kind of, if you take the ratio, you get kind of a funny shape here. If you look at this curve, doesn't look like physics in a way you think, okay, well, probably the uncertainties are very big, but that's not true. It's just that you kind of take the centralities at, at integer numbers, you have some centrality called, uh, uh, classes, which are not integer, and, and then you take the ratio, and then this, this curve makes complete sense. You have to do this quite carefully, actually. So I mean, you would think naively that if you take a centrality class 50.07, doesn't matter, 50 or 50.07. And for the multiplicity, it doesn't even matter that much. But if you take two ratios of these classes, then suddenly it ma makes a big difference. So you really have to kind of do the centrality class interacting, copying these numbers, and then taking the ratio. And in that case, for instance, here, we show this in the appendix. Uh, you, can, you can see, for instance, this is just the, the multiplicity ratio of the ruthenium over zirconium in principle so so yeah so so here what we what we actually do is for ruthenium and we take this case number five it's kind of so it's a, just to show you this effect of these different numbers we don't divide divide the ruthenium over zirconium no we divide ruthenium over ruthenium but using the centrality class of ruthenium over the centrality class of zirconium so just to show you this effect because ruthenium over ruthenium and then we also do it for zirconium over zirconium so, so that these are different simulations, completely independent, right? Also different kind of shapes, but just to show that effect, and you see this multiplicity kind of really do, doing this kind of thing, and it kind of explains part of this, this curve. So, so that's, that's important to do that. I mean, here it's really like 4% effect. And, and even for V2, you see that this also makes a difference. You really have to do this carefully because for V2, I mean, it's not a big effect. For V2, it's biggest for 10 to 20% centrality uh, re region, and it's like a 0.2% effect. <laughs> but 0.2% effect is actually, and then on here, the statistical errors seem very big, but that's not true because the installation, these, uh, these, these ratios is within the same data set and they're very correlated. So you see that these blue point and the red points, they're completely different data sets. So you, you, these, these errors are usually overestimated because we didn't do these correlations correctly. We, we put that out, but that's why I put these two curves here. And, and here this, yeah, so this, this, this uncertainty is not so big, it's 0.2%, but it actually competes with the systematic uncertainty quoted for this kind of thing. So, so kind of, it's just a curiosity you need to do carefully by reading this paper. And, okay, so, so maybe, uh, do I go into all these details? Maybe a little bit, yeah. So, so in STAR, then again, where you need to be careful, but also in interacting, we have to be careful here. So, so this is this multiplicity distribution of ruthenium and zirconium. So this is just the number of raw tracks you measure in the star detector, and then the distribution. So the data points are there. And then we also have the triactive predictions. And uh, they're also in the curve. And of course, it's a little bit difficult to see because it's a log scale. So, so it's, it's very, very rare to have these very high multiplicity events. And then these are somewhat hidden. And but then there are many things you need to be careful about. So in particular, for at least it's for instance a little bit easier. So at least if you look at the centrality classes, so for instance, it's the 80%, 70%, 60%. So most events are actually very low multiplicity. They're all here. But what you see, for instance, if you in this, this region is that triactin has many more here than star. And this is actually easy to explain because well, these are low multiplicity events, so star just misses some of them. And 
is experimentally, this, this, the, 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 you know that it's actually quite difficult to, to, to measure them, and that's known. For at least, for instance, it's a bit easier. So at least, at least they think, and I think it's true, that they can measure zero to 90% centrality, and 90 to 100%, you miss some, you don't really know how many collisions happen. And what at least then does is from 90% to 0% to fit your Monte Carlo Dalva model or Trento model in this distribution. And then you infer the collisions in the end by this, uh, by this model. So it's kind of a theoretical, it, it, it relies on theory where you put your 100%. But for starters, it's a bit more difficult even because they, I think, say that from 50%, uh, they trust it's from 0 to 50%. And the other, the other part is, is fitted by the Monte Carlo Dalva model. Which is kind of what they did here with this Glauber model K3, so that also depends a bit what kind of Glauber model you take, because the Glauber model depends on this uh, the, the radius of the proton and the radius of the neutron. And uh, yeah, so, so you need to do this really quite carefully. And uh, in particular, when constructing, for instance, also the rate of, so, so that, that, that defines the centrality selection, you need to do it quite carefully. And that's also why I don't really like so much, for instance, to, to compare this kind of multiplicity versus centrality, because it really depends so strongly if you get this 100% right. And well, if you say that you only know 0 to 50% really accurately, then it comes really quite model dependent. And that's also why I try to look quite carefully into this, this ratio, because this is raw data, and this is just the number of well, the distribution, the number of particles uh, that you measure this number of particles, and it doesn't rely on centrality. Actually, the centralities come from this, and these are these lines here, these are the centrality bits. Uh, so this is more direct in that way. And um, well, but, but then okay, when you take this ratio, uh, well, okay, so I should, I should say one more thing, which is tracking subtlety. So we also here put a, a ratio. So we, we actually, in the end, run tracking at slightly too low energy. Uh, so we didn't really fit the total multiplicity. So we multiply both of them by a factor 1.21 to correct that, that the tracking is not really fit at 200 GeV. Um, and then, okay, so, so that, that's one correction factor and the ratio, you shouldn't matter too much. We check this a little bit, but okay, I should maybe do this again. One other thing is that at very high multiplicity, star detector misses many more uh, particles. So this is kind of detector efficiency. So this is also raw tracks. And if you don't take this factor into account, like that's 500 number of particles, the, the, the efficiency is only 80%, then also these curves will be completely off. So you kind of take into account all these effects. You take into account that you only trust it from 50% onwards. And then you kind of take this double ratio of kind of this, well, it's a double ratio because these curves, they are not integrated. Well, in, in, in the, the, the curve, the, the, the experimental curve is integrated to one, but okay, you know that here it's completely off because things we don't understand, experimental uncertainty. The, 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 the triaxin curve, the triaxin curve doesn't integrate to one because I fitted it to be on the same line. So, so there is it's an offset here because you miss some collisions experimentally. But what's then done here in this thing is a double ratio. So you actually integrate everything from 50 to infinity, such that it integrates to one from 50, both curves where you trust them. And then you take the double ratio in that way from ruthenium to zirconium. And then you get this kind of uh, zirconium of ruthenium multiplicity distribution. And that's, of course, in the final result. And it's very nice that you see this trajectory curve, especially for this ultra, these, these ultra central collisions. So these are 300 number of particles. And it's really like if you look at this blue line here, this is 1% centrality class. So it's really ultra central. But still, this, this case five goes, goes straight through the data. It's really quite impressive. Also, this, these other ones, the, 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 the case two, three, four, also go do quite well. Not as well here. So this case two flattens out here. Uh, so really for peripheral, this, this still make, makes a difference. And here also you don't fit exactly, but it's also where star, you don't really rely on the star measurement. So, so here you already see that this case five is doing really, really quite well. Okay, so very subtleties and you need to do all these things carefully, but okay, that's my, my star story here. Okay, so I do know, but I think like, as you said, like this case five is sort of my construction, because don't they use this variable to define, you know? I thought it was a multiplicity distribution that is used. Nah, this beta three was more or less fitted to the T3, the triangular throw. So you have mm -hmm. that's as the a function of centrality. Yeah. As a function of centrality, but I thought the beta two and beta three also came out of the multiplicity distribution. This this very central stuff. A little bit, but I don't think so much because also this case three four, they also do quite well there. So 
beta three I mean it deforms the nucleus it doesn't change the multiplicity so much a little bit I mean you're definitely right a little bit but I think the, the beta three mostly affects the v three and the v two and not the multiplicity so much I don't know, I have much more on this on the next slide so so these are then actually the main the main results of these simulations so these are all these five cases again right well, one to five and I I, I I it's annoying but I couldn't well, I should have turned on Skype as well but I need to have the Wi-Fi connected and all that um so yeah so so um yeah I like this case five and so you take the v2 of ruthenium the v2 of zirconium and well you have all these results and and what's actually important you have the star data as well what's important to note is that both for ruthenium and zirconium we don't really fit the data very Right? I mean, it's really off by at least 10%. And well, it's good to also, we didn't include systematic surface of star here. I don't think they're known. Uh, but uh, this is also this is probably much more important that the triactin is only fitted on Alice data. So the, the viscosity, for instance, I think actually one of the conclusions, if you look at RIC data, you apply the same exact model, you probably need somewhat lower, uh, uh, larger viscosity to bring down the V2. Could be one conclusion. We have to look at gold, gold more carefully, and it's on our agenda and things like that. But okay, one thing to notice is that it doesn't, that, yeah, it doesn't fit exactly. But actually, on the backup or somewhat later, I, I could show you that if you double the viscosity, that these curves they change a lot, but the ratio actually doesn't. So that, that of course also makes some sense, right? Because viscosity moves it in the same direction. So if you take the ratio, doesn't actually matter so much. And it's a ratio where we're then really interested in. So this is also why these isobar collisions are so nice because so many of these uncertainties we don't know very well, they, they cancel. And, and, and that's why this ratio is very interesting. And you have these black ones are the star data points. And you really see this case five doing really extremely well, especially when it's V2. Uh, also, yeah, so, so I think that I say, well, we, we run like that for, for five years. We run, run actually the five million hydro events. So you computationally, if in hydro, it's a little bit. Well, on one thing which is important here is to use a boost invariant model because the principle, I guess, that these kind of energies that's still fine to energy uh, But okay, if you want to go to lower energies, you get three dimensional effects. And uh, so you then would get even more expensive. But okay, this is already kind of on the expensive side. But okay, so this one works very well. The other ones don't really. So that, that's, of course, something you should really notice. And then yeah, and to come back to your question, okay, you have to leave, but this beta three really kind of it is the thing that, that really makes that you get the D three more or less correct. What we actually notice is that you overshoot here a little bit. And this is because it's fitted to APT. And yeah, so, so we, we would really need a somewhat smaller beta three here. But if we use a smaller beta three, then the D two also goes up and it's also central bit. So actually this work is not completely done in that, in that way. So beta two, beta three, I think. There's still, yeah, still more to the story and also from a nuclear structure point of view, which we should study. So it's interesting that V2 really does distinguish your uh, case five versus three and four, right? Yeah, very much, but it's not so surprising, right? Because this case four, well, case four, case three, they're both by assumption spherical. So, okay, right. so you don't see much. And here they're equal to beta twos. Oh, so, okay, right. once you take the ratio again, but well, still matters a bit because of the radii are different. Like you're really right. selecting very specific events with high multiplicity. So, it still matters a little bit. That's beta two is very different for case five. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's more motivated by these, these electron ion scatterings. And that's actually yeah. a relatively robust method to get yeah. this difference. Okay, that's, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you also see that beta two is bigger for ruthenium and beta three right. is bigger for zirconium. And that's, of course, exactly the reason why here the V2 goes up and the beta three goes down. Yeah. And also notice what we get the whole centrality dependence, right? And that's, of course, interesting. But if you really think about this beta two and beta three, like, like a spear shaped and elliptical shaped, then um, selecting these, these very central events makes a lot of sense because then, then they're exactly head on. And if you have elliptical things and they're exactly head on, then you really get this full ellipticity because if they're not exactly head on, it would not give an over central event. So, this is why these this, this over central bins are always very nice to get the beta two and beta threes. And that's also what, what's on the next slide. So, here we look at that in a way more carefully uh, and also without the centrality selections again. So, here is really this C2 as a function of the number of tracks, this raw data again detected for. Uh, experimental efficiency and so on. 
Um, and, and indeed, so, so this ratio here as a function of pixel, so this 350 is really no percentile effect. So here, I put the, I put a line here, 0.01% centrality. So here you really need 5 million collisions and oversampling here. So we really have like 10 times more than these 5 million collisions, effectively like 50 million to get these data points here. And you see indeed that also if you go to, so here I had zero to 5% bin, and you get an effect of like 0 0.25, 2.5%. But if you go to this 0.1% centrality bin here, you have more like also the data and effectively 8%. So you can really increase this by going to very, very central collisions. So you need, of course, very high statistics, you need this ratio. And by the end, it's quite impressive, right? I mean, you see this V2 ratio. Also, you hear that here, I put the V2 separately for this case size, right? I mean, you'll hardly see the difference, but this ratio is then something you can actually get out of the nuclear structure kind of computations. And similarly for V3. One thing we don't actually get very well is the mean PT fluctuations. So this is also in this, this star paper, uh, or no, and it's actually in a quark matter presentation, I think, but I could, yeah, they, they, I could get this data. And, and you see that they kind of consistently are below. Mean PT fluctuations are harder. So even with these 5 million collisions, we don't get it very accurately, but okay. I mean, you can combine bins and then the statistical error will go down and you see that we're really a little bit off here, so which is something which I think we don't understand actually why we don't get that very well. So, so maybe um, maybe you've done this already. You could check that by comparing uranium uranium with gold gold. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, that would be very interesting. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's actually yeah. We, we focus mostly for now on LHC, and this is kind of our sure. first attempt. But yeah, this uranium gold, it, I think, is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this one, I'm trying to understand this. So your mean PT, the, the double ratio is less than one, which means that you are generating more lower momentum in both. Uh, I, I, I skipped a little bit here. So the mean PT is over here. The mean PT of, of uh, medium zirconium is the ratio. Mm -hmm. And you see also an enormous difference in the mean PT uh, because of this proton and neutron skin. But if you take the ratio, it's not such a big effect. Well, it's a big effect, but not such a big effect. And the data yeah, thinks that's not. The volume is the culprit. That's, that's the one that's, Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Because that's the neutral skin. Right. But that's the mean PT. These are mean PT fluctuations. Oh, so that's very different. It's, uh, it's the distribution of the mean PTs so I'm taking the, the, the second moment. Yeah. So it's a different observable. It's also like a little bit harder statistically. Um, yeah. So the sigma flux, for instance, is the main mm -hmm. thing that. that yeah, you could, but you don't want to say that that proton proton collisions fluctuate more in feeding the zirconia. So I actually don't know what, what, why this is mm -hmm. not so. Yeah, then I'm finishing because it's noon and also not that much more to say. I mean, for instance, we tried a few more things just to, to highlight some things, like for instance, we took this case five and then we could took the case five and beta three equals zero. So it's really to just highlight this pear shape for a little bit. How much does it matter that it's pear shape? And what's kind of obvious is that once you take beta three to zero, that this effect in the V three goes away. Actually, not entirely. The referee was very excited about that. So if you, <laughs> yeah, because this one has beta three non zero, these all have beta three zero. But okay, the statistical error is quite large. But okay, we improved it a little bit, and uh, and also if you combine all of them, it's really different from one. Uh, so. In NPT, you don't get that. So if you don't, so we didn't put in this beta three, but there is some difference just because of the sizes. I think we understand more or less why this is, and there's still a significant uh, difference from one in the V three, and that's maybe also why we overshoot here a little bit. So so that's I think what. I'm about. And what's then very important here from this this figure actually, okay, so we overshoot here a little bit, but we of course we, we should fit this at some point, but once you start modifying this beta three, then this V two also changes a lot. So that, that kind of tells you, you cannot just tune beta three to V3 and then tune the beta two to V2. It's really, well, then you say you need to kind of a global Bayesian analysis or something like that. And yeah, then there's more work to do. Okay, well, I'm running out of time. So you just ask me if you want to know. We did a very careful analysis about V22 or epsilon 22. And that's, that's something people usually say, like if you have some uh, anisotropic initial state, that the epsilon 2 translates into the P2 with some factor. And that's much easier because then you can only have to do your initial state model. You don't need to do any hydro, you can zero smash, 
you get immediately defeated too. And we tried that and it, it's completely off. So it didn't work. And uh, actually it works if you do zirconium over zirconium, like what I showed you before in the centrality phase, uh, that then it works. But if you do rubidium over zirconium, it doesn't work. And we, I think it's just because you're, you're dividing two things, it's a small effect. So if you're dividing two things here and you're dividing two things here, it only works if this kappa is the same. So if you have zirconium over zirconium, well, then the kappa is the same because you're doing the same thing. But this kappa depends on the size of the system as well. So this is kind of, there's like an order one effect here, a leading one effect here, leading one effect there. And that's why, why it doesn't really quite work. And it's a bit disappointing in a way because otherwise you could use this epsilon two to predict the V2. But I think you really have to do the hydro, which makes the simulations much more expensive. This thing I already said that we tried it, we halved eta over s, we doubled eta over s, we doubled the viscosity, and you see like all these curves, they change quite wildly, but the ratios, they all make, stay the same. So it's kind of what they said, that these ratios cancel. And uh, yeah, well, I mean, so, so okay, I, I'm actually very excited about the iceberg collision. I think this, this run was a very big success. So you really kind of, this, uh, so many of the systematics cancel very well, the statistics were very, were very, very small, so you really have this kind of precision physics, which is for, for this is nuclear structure and understanding all the details exactly right. And also if you understand all the details about nuclear structure, you can understand more about E over S. So yeah, so, so I think this, this is kind of, it's both experimentally and theoretically very interesting. This is the, the downside is of course, this precision also requires many events. So computationally, I mean, normally we do like 20,000 events. Here you have like at least millions of events, so it's expensive. Uh, then well, I kind of said it's beta three, beta four, or beta three, beta two, we need kind of, so we did five parameter settings. I mean, it's a little bit, that's not very systematic. So you would maybe do like, so this is a scan, a global analysis maybe you would want to do. Well, maybe you can do it, but it's just, yeah, it requires a few million CPU hours. Not, not that much, but it's possible. Um, yeah, so maybe you kind of can, can get this initial, st with, with, without running the hydro, that would be better. So to have like, Maybe we can estimate how this kappa changes from zirconium and ruthenium. And if you know that, and it doesn't depend much on where you are in your parameter space, then you can use this one. So you can kind of try to work into that direction to kind of simplify things and make things at least more efficient. But, uh, okay, and then for instance, this is, we don't have three plus one D, we don't have a barrel number, which is relevant to slower energies. And, and okay, well, the whole motivation of this thing is of course, kind of magnetic effect or magnetic effects just magnetic effects themselves, right? I mean, not even chiral, but magnetic effects also cause like direct flow of charge like and unlike signs. So you have like differences in that, that way. So, so uh, yeah, so this is of course still, and I think it's still an interesting direction to pursue in them when you have to add magnetic, magnetic fields interact them, uh, it will take some time. Um, I have I have maybe one proposal mm -hmm. because there's a lunch connected to this mm -hmm. for the people that sort of signed up but then don't not food for people that want to stay. Um, maybe we take questions for people that don't stay for lunch and then we sort of get sure. lunch and yeah. evolve it into a discussion yeah. with the group. Is an idea? So maybe if there's a question on Zoom, because those oh there were raised hands. Probably, I don't know if they were all. Were all yeah, so Burnt and Tom have uh, raised hands. Yeah, Burnt, you can go first. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, thanks. This, this was very interesting. Really good. Um, I have a question about um, the next and, and how, how this can be used further. I, I mean, obviously, as you mentioned, there is the possibility of trying to understand more about the nuclear structure. Um, let's keep that aside for the moment. But, but focus on the question of what actually will theory be able to tell us about the original purpose of the experiment, namely um, looking for the chiromagnetic effect and its uh, signatures. And um, so there are two possibilities here. One is uh, the asking, is it possible to reduce the systematic uncertainties in the analysis to such an extent that one actually push the limit um, even further down on the limit on a contribution by the current magnetic effect. The other one is to say, okay, um, what does theory, what can theory tell us about the ingredients of the current magnetic effect given the data? 
And I've recently, uh, in my summary talk at the Strange Quark Meta, I, I uh, emphasized that I think it would be good to do the second one and focus on the second one in particular at this point, because there are really two aspects that go into the current magnetic effect from a theoretical point of view. One is, um, what's the magnetic field? Can we put, uh, can we constrain the magnetic field, both, um, you know, in space and time? And, and, and there also one could look not only on the current magnetic effect uh, observables, but also on say the lambda and anti-lambda polarization. Um, and the other one is to, if one has everything under control, to try to understand what limits we get on the uh, winding number fluctuations in the nuclear collision. And uh, my question to you is really, do you see that as a viable direction for theorists or um, is the <laughs> or, or is the distance between what can be simulated and these aspects too far to to actually do something like that yeah yeah well thanks very much for the question i i guess you understand that i purposefully didn't go into this <laughs> but also because for Triaxin, I think at the moment we cannot say too much, but well, of course I know more about the theory, although I have to stress that I, I never worked on the chiral magnetic effect myself, so I'm not an expert in that. Uh, what I, well, what I learned a little bit from this analysis is that I think once you take a ratio plot like this, um, and you have like statistical errors, which are extremely small, well, also the effect is, well, the effect in this case is like 3%, but okay, now I think we understand a little bit more that it's a V2 effect and we, we understand this V2 effect a little bit. It's also just because the size and the multiplicity, so you can kind of renormalize it a little bit. And there are more recent papers that you actually, at least in hindsight, could have expected that this, these, have, these, these signals are proportional V2 and multiplicity, and they should be more or less around these values. And and that's, I think, progress, right? I mean, because, because then, but this is just the size and the elliptic flow and this kind of nuclear structure I was already talking about. Then for your question is then indeed, like once you know that, then you know, if you look more precisely, do we see magnetic effects? And then secondly, I think, chiromagnetic effects. And first, first you have to look at magnetic effects. But then you start looking at this curve and well, then the effects are suddenly, once you realize the, the effects are suddenly not so big anymore, like at most half a percent. And then, of course, that means you have to understand also these observables at, at that level of precision. And while we actually plotted with it, I mean, for zirconium raffinium, we can, for instance, we can plot it gamma one, one, two, but it's, it's a relatively complicated observable with these like, unlike sign particles. And you, the, the, the problem here is you can see it immediately. It's a very naive, so you see the statistical uncertainty here from star. It is a very naive statistical uncertainty. It's just you can compute it relatively naively if you have four billion events. Well, we have four million events. So you can <laughs> very naively, if 1,000, uh, you, you see what happens with statistical uncertainty. So, so the, the, the reality is we cannot compute this. And, and that's a problem, I think, because, well, because it's, you're looking at a half percent effect. You really want to understand all the details. I'm not so sure if you can just naively estimate it like this is qualitatively, this is the background. If it's positive, there's kind of magnetic effect is negative. No, because there's also resonance in case. There's lots of physics going on there and all of it you need to understand very precisely. And when actually Tarectum, I said it was scalable. I mean, in principle, we can actually do the four billion events and then see what happens. But then we miss so much of the essential physics like the magnetic field itself that at the moment I, I, I didn't feel comfortable doing that. Uh, so that's that point. And then, then the point is, of course, and I think about well, Trishna, Umut, and Dima, for instance, they look into that already, like there's also magnetic effects and they have similar kind of things. So if we don't even know what the magnetic field is, and, and I think I want to stress that we really uh, don't have an idea, but you know, maybe if you have two spectator nucleons passing by, you can naively get the magnetic field of t equals zero, but how quickly it decays is extremely important. And uh, I would say almost zero is known mm -hmm. about that. So that, I mean, well, the first step I think we did is nuclear structure and we, we haven't finished it. The second step is to kind of get a handle on how this magnetic field decreases over time. And then, well, as you said, like this, this, these winding number fluctuations, that's then the first step, which is also not much known about. Um, yeah, so I think it's a, it's a great playground for theorists, but yeah, well, they need some manpower and there's a lot of things to do. And I think, yeah, you need to be quite precise. Okay, thank you. Cool. Yeah.
Um, yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, we a great talk. So I have a few like um, more, um, more, more uh, concrete questions. I mean, not concrete, more, more like detailed questions. So can you turn to, I think, slide 11? Yeah, okay. here. So if you look at the um, ruthenium over zirconium B3 plot, and it looks like, although like your case five fits relatively well on the more central side, you can see that the, on like, uh, I think this is like the 50, 60 and 60, 70. Um, so once you get beyond like 55%, this curve just skyrockets up to, I don't know, I can't even do an extrapolation on where it is. So do you have, an idea about like where the number is actually going on the uh, 60. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for the question. Yeah, I, I mean, in hindsight, I, I, I guess I just plotted the same range, and at the P2, it's definitely okay. But it, yeah, these these gray arrow bars are our statistical uncertainties, and they're just real. I mean, these are different data sets, and yeah, so the the, the curve skyrocket, but the, the statistical uncertainties as well. So this is just a, yeah, it's just a matter of statistics, and probably you're right that we should not have even shown it. Yeah, right. So what is, okay, so just to follow up, so what is the reason that like by uh, 60 to 70, your like B3 uh, uncertainty is also like just blowing up? Because if you look at the V2 plot and also the average PT plot, it seems more or less constrained. I mean, I get it, like V3 is a more consuming stuff, but I'm still kind of surprised that uh, you know it, it goes as huge as it is right now. <laughs> yeah, well, you're right about that. But okay, I, yeah, the P3 is is more just much more difficult than the P2 simply because it's smaller. You use a very few particles. You need it's kind of a, not really a P. It's got still two particle correlation. Um, well, yeah, I think it's quite obvious because it's a small signal that it's a harder observable, but. Okay, I, I see your point that the P2 mm -hmm. so this contents are really much smaller than the P3, and that's definitely how it yeah, is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how you exactly place it. That's maybe the reason. Okay, okay, gotcha. And also, is it probably that now I'm looking at it in like more detail? Is it probably that you are predicting a close to zero V3 for zirconium, which is in the denominator, and then like everything's blowing up suddenly. Uh, that's related, but also, I mean, for these peripheral bins, I mean, the, yeah, so that's important. I think both, so this is, well, okay. So this uncertainties, I should show you that maybe I have them actually here, right? Yeah, so this one, the, the uh, here, the, 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 the dash ones is the most accurate one we have. So it's case like 5 million collisions. So here you can, actually see this V3 statistical uncertainty clearly, which is of course much better. So you see actually it's quite small. Uh, so it's definitely, this is statistically accurate and it goes much below the data point. Both are um, actually, so the you, data points go up. Actually, can you use your mouse? Cause I like, um, I, I, can, I can see you, but like where your finger's pointing at is just like a blank <laughs> white stuff. Exactly. Uh, sorry. So uh, yeah, so if you look at this 50 to 60% centrality bit of V3, you uh -huh. see actually the statistical uh, uncertainty and it's quite small. And what's an important right. effect for peripheral collisions, with, especially at, at, uh, at RIC, is you have very few particles. So there's a very large non-flow contribution coming in here, like resonances. Mm -hmm. uh, so you wouldn't trust these data points too much and maybe also not the ratio. And, and it is true when you're saying that these things are statistically difficult and yeah, I, I, I wouldn't read too much into it. Okay, okay, cool, thanks. Yeah, and the other question, I guess it's more of a comment that is uh, I'm kind of surprised on slide 11, you, like there is no uh, average PT uh, um, from STAR. I mean, I get that like the CME group doesn't really care about it, but uh, yeah, I think I might come in now, now that the rain has stopped, I'm, I might come in further and that uh, we can talk about it. Maybe I can get to the data like relatively. I think this data is maybe a maybe available right now. I don't know if somebody from Sarah mm -hmm. knows. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll come in and after now we can talk. Yeah, there it. is some internal, I, I talked to people and they said it, it fits well, but okay, I think I didn't see the data myself at the moment. But okay. Yeah, okay.
Yeah, all right, thanks. All right, and let's uh, wrap it up, sort of, go to lunch, and then just stay here for more discussion.